Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. This episode of the Human Experience Podcast is brought to you by Fine Mindfulness. Mindfulness these days is huge. Mass media is starting to understand the benefits of taking time to pause and reflect. Have you ever been interested in mindfulness and meditation? Have you ever wanted to create a practice, but you just fall off track? Well, this is where Fine Mindfulness comes in. They offer a community that will help you create those powerful lasting habits that keep you training your mind. Whether you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a college student running a startup, Find Mindfulness can help you. Find Mindfulness is a 30 day program. How often are you looking at your cell phone? Just ask yourself how often you look at your cell phone and then tell yourself that you need to take this course. Mention the human experience. Go and sign up right now at www.findmindfulness.dequincy. In it, we discuss consciousness and his book, Blind Spots 21 Good Reasons to Think Before You Talk. And yeah, it was an interesting read. It was actually quite challenging to get through just because I usually move through books pretty fast. With this one, I it took me some time. I had to process what I was reading just because it really does challenge your paradigms and the things that you've been told through new age movements. And so I really think you guys will enjoy this episode. It is a little highbrow and perhaps I wasn't asking the right questions. Nonetheless, it's a good interview. The call did drop a few times. It did make it a little bit difficult to sustain a sort of flow within the conversation. All in all, good interview, good episode. Please make sure you check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, at The Human XP. Please become a member. Five bucks a month. The price of a cup of coffee. It will help us sustain our server costs. I would really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. The Human Experience is deconstructing consciousness as we speak to my guest, Christian D. Quincy. Christian, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Thanks. It's good to be here. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. So, Christian, I mean, you're you're a professor of philosophy and con- consciousness studies. You graduated uh, at John F. Kennedy University. You're the dean of consciousness studies at of philosophical research. You're an award winning author. You founded the Wisdom Academy. You seem to have un- unlocked a hero level achievement in the consciousness field. Um, what sparked this interest for you, and what about consciousness fascinates you so much? Ah, okay. So, well, the the story goes back a long way. Um, it's actually something I have written about in one of my, my other books, Radical Knowing, where I talk about when I was a child of about seven or eight years um, living in, in Ireland, and it was a rainy day, and I had nothing to do, so I picked up my old, my father's old tattered encyclopedia, and uh, started reading through it, and came across a drawing of a dinosaur that was associated with an entry, an article on evolution. So I started reading, and um, there was a lot I didn't understand, but I understood enough to be surprised that not only did I come from my parents, but and they from their grandparents, and all the way back to the beginnings of humanity, but that humans themselves evolved from some prior ape-like ancestors that came from other mammals, that came from reptiles, that came from amphibians, that came from fish, and all the way back through jellyfish to what that old encyclopedia called infusoria, single-celled critters that we would call 
protozoa or bacteria. So I was astounded at that early age to realize that my earliest ancestors were bacteria. But even more than that, I wondered, well, between bacteria and me sitting here in my parents' room in, in Ireland, between bacteria and humans, where did this ability to wonder consciousness, to be able to think, where did that first arise in the great unfolding of evolution? Mm -hmm. And so I looked at my dog and I was pretty sure, yeah, I'm sure dogs have it and the cat. And yes, I was sure that she had it too. So I um, looked at the goldfish and um, after a few moments of hesitation decided that yes, even goldfish, even fish have consciousness. And then I wondered about the worms out in the back garden, whether they had this ability to wonder, to think, to be conscious. And I couldn't decide one way or the other. Um, so somewhere between fish and worms, I figured that consciousness had um, come into being. But exactly where um, the encyclopedia didn't answer that question, and that question of where in the great unfolding of evolution did consciousness first arise it stayed with me in the background. And then in my late teens and early 20s, I started um, reading up to see if I could find an answer to that question. And I started by studying evolutionary biology. And after a, a while, I realized that um, there's no way that biology is going to be able to answer a question about consciousness. So then I shifted over to psychology. And um, although I found it fascinating reading about perception and other psychological phenomena, I realized after a while that, um, that actually the science of psychology had nothing to say about consciousness. It, back in those days, and still to some extent today, um, it was dominated by behaviorism, which had no room for mind or consciousness. So then I thought, well, it's really a philosophical question. It's a question about the nature of the relationship between consciousness and the physical world. And so I then dived into philosophy, but, and particularly philosophy of mind, which was the, um, the discipline that addressed this question. Mm -hmm. But I soon came to realize that there are two English languages. There's the English that we all speak, and then there's the English that philosophers speak. And, and I just had real difficulty back then decoding the language of philosophy, uh, Western academic philosophy. And so then I turned my attention to Eastern philosophies, to Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism in particular, and was delighted to find a wealth of information that was focused on consciousness. Right. But right. it had nothing to say about evolution. And so my question still remained unanswered. And so in desperation, I turned back to Western academic philosophy of mind, this time really determined to crack the code. And, and I did. And along the way, I rediscovered the work of the, my favorite philosopher, the British um, metaphysician, Alfred North Whitehead, mm -hmm. and, um, and found that the answer to my question was nowhere that consciousness didn't arise anywhere in the great unfolding of evolution for the simple fact that it was always present, that consciousness always um, existed wherever there was matter, there was some or energy, there's some form of consciousness. And so I then became enthralled with the um, philosophical position of panpsychism, which states that all matter is intrinsically sentient and that consciousness goes all the way down it was there not only in the fish and the worms, but in the cells of the fish and any animal, in the molecules of those cells, in the, in the atoms and the subatomic particles and the quark or quanta or whatever lies at the fundamental basis of physical reality. There is some degree, some trace of consciousness, ability, an ability to feel, to be aware, to make choices exists at that level. So, I mean, you're connecting the atoms that are floating around in matter and and then you're moving towards human relationships i mean i i found your book uh challenging to read actually i usually can finish a book in in a couple days i found myself uh you know I, I started reading this book last week and i found myself reading a few pages and scribbling a bunch of lines taking notes i would i would 
read a few pages and then kind of put it down and I would have to absorb what you said. And I found I found the back of what it says on your book quite hilarious. I'm just going to read that. Um, we live in a world filled with cliches, convenient assumptions and unquestioned conclusions that many of us use without giving them a second thought. We all spread these thought viruses, infecting everyone we come in contact with. But many of these blind spots in how we think about ourselves and the world do not withstand rigorous scrutiny or even casual scrutiny in some cases, yet they fall out of the mouths of scientists, religious teachers, journalists, and authors with dumbfounding frequency. Wow, that's quite a statement. So I was challenging many of the basic assumptions um, that um, we find in modern science and philosophy that most scientists and philosophers that I'm aware of just take for granted. And so it's, it's understandable that um, if the, you know, the experts, so to speak, um, take these ideas for granted without much questioning, that the general public, the lay audience, is likely to also take them for granted. And so by challenging these um, deeply ingrained assumptions um, can take time, can, can be, people need to take, take, have a double take to find out exactly what I'm saying and, 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 and why, um, why people don't notice the, the absurdities of many of the positions that are taken for granted. And um, if you like, and if we have time, we can go into yeah, some of Yeah, I would love to get into that. We won't have time to go into all of them, of course. Um, right. I mean, let's get into the very first one that you mentioned, that we, I think it's the first one, that we create our own reality. And, I mean, I, I, found, I found what you said intriguing, um, that we, in fact, don't create reality. We color our, our thoughts, color reality. The color, we color the way that we perceive reality. Can you, can you detail that? Can you get into that for us, please? Yeah, I, I sure can. And, and by the way, that, that wasn't the first blind spot in the book. We can come back to the first one if you like. It was <laughs> okay. um, uh, everything came from nothing, and you know, in the Big Bang. And that's that's the. It opens with that for a, for a specific reason. But uh, the question that you ask, I think, occurs very early on uh, that we create our own reality. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. Um, first of all. If it were true that each of us creates our own reality, then how could we ever communicate? If you lived in your created, self-created reality, and I lived in my self-created reality, what would be the common link that would enable us to communicate? I mean, clearly, we live in realities that overlap, because right now you and I are communicating. Mm -hmm. So we obviously don't live in our own separate self-created realities. We live in a shared reality. So that's the first thing. It's, it, we don't exist in our own reality. But the second point is, is that we certainly don't create reality because we as a species have been around for what? A couple of million years, give or take. Right. And clearly reality has existed <laughs> for a long time. Even this universe has been around for about 14 billion years before we came on the scene. Yeah. But clearly, reality does not depend on human consciousness or human intention for reality to exist. So it's the other way around. It's not that we create reality. Reality created us. So neither do we create our own reality, nor do we create any reality through our thoughts. And, and that's, that's the third um, aspect of that blind spot is that actually thoughts don't create anything except perhaps trouble. Thoughts and beliefs are just abstractions that um, they're like frozen snapshots of experience. Experience happens naturally and automatically from moment to moment to moment. And uh, what a thought is, it's like freeze framing one of those moments and then putting it to one side. But meanwhile, um, experiences keep happening. And so the, the, the thought that we had one moment is out of date by the time the next moment of experience arises. And so all our thoughts and beliefs are made of thoughts, are made of these abstractions. All our thoughts relate to some time in the past, some moment ago, not to the current moment of reality. And one thing that I often um, talk about with my students is I ask the question, when does consciousness or experience happen? And 
everybody says right now, and then I say, when does reality happen? Well, again, reality happens right now in the present moment. So um, experience and reality coincide. Therefore, the optimum way to know reality, to know what was actually going on, what is actually happening, is to pay attention to our embodied experience in the moment, not to the thoughts and beliefs we have about reality, because they refer to a reality that no longer exists. It's in the past, it may be just a few moments ago, or indeed it might be way back in our childhood, or indeed in some prior lifetime. This notion that we create our own reality has become incredibly popular. It's it's very it's very mainstream in New Age movements, I mean, such as The Secret. A lot of people are pitching this idea uh-huh. so i mean so then how does this, this work i mean are we kind of, do we have our own little bubbles that we kind of interpret information with and then you know as i speak to you those sort of bubbles kind of coalesce and and we exchange information that way yeah well i, I think i think the reason that um people have these very different ideas that, for example the idea that we create our own reality Mm-hmm. Whereas I show in, in this book, Blind Spots, that that cannot be true. The reason that such cliches and blind spots like that persist is because people don't actually take the time to think through the assumptions that they hold and they just take for granted. Um, and so what this book is about, and the subtitle um, I mentioned is um, 21 Good Reasons to Think Before We Talk. So. People actually don't stop to think. They just accept these ideas without question. And so what this book is doing is stopping and asking and encouraging and inviting people to think a little bit deeper and to show them that actually these 21 cliches really don't make any sense once, once we decide to look at them more closely. They just don't withstand close scrutiny. Um, so yes, a lot of people um, have the idea and really cling to the idea that we create our own reality. But as I pointed out, is that cannot be the case because if that were the case, we could never communicate. And clearly, reality isn't something that we create; it's the other way around. Reality creates us because it has existed long before we even um, evolved into into being. If consciousness is subjective and the process of life is objective, then how? I mean, how does how do we connect this together? How do we use this in relationships? If you're married, how is my consciousness affecting the consciousness of another person? Well, boy, you you've packed in a lot of topics there with um, lots of in, at least implicit questions. Um, but you you began by asking how is the objective process of life related to the subjective process of consciousness. Right. Um, so we can pick that up and then come back to the topic of relationships. Sure. Um, in, as I mentioned earlier, that um, the, the worldview that seems to me to make the most sense to account for the fact that matter exists, bodies exist, and consciousness exists, we know that to be the case. Um, but the, 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 the philosophy that best accounts for the existence of both of those and their relationship is panpsychism, the idea that matter or energy is intrinsically sentient. So every object is also a subject. There's no separation between them. It doesn't mean they are identical. And that's another blind spot that is very, very prevalent, is that people... Um, hear that something, that two things like consciousness and and embodiment might be different, might be distinct, and they assume that therefore they are separate. But distinction is not the same as separateness. So just because two realities are distinct, consciousness and and embodiment, or mind Mm -hmm. and matter, doesn't mean they are separate. No, Mm -hmm. they always go together. Um, And so wherever you have, and maybe this is the, the major point that um, you need to get to be able to, it's kind of like maybe the code to so much of the, the alternative positions that I'm presenting in this book. Okay. And if, you, if you don't get this, the rest probably will keep seeming very strange to you, is that we have to give up the idea that either the basic reality is matter, which is called materialism, and that somehow, in a way that's inexplicable, mind or consciousness emerged or evolved from pure objective matter. That's just a non-starter philosophically. Mm -hmm. The other idea is um, idealism, 
that's common in many, many spiritual traditions, particularly Eastern spiritual traditions, is the reverse idea. It's the idea that mind or consciousness or spirit is the ultimate reality and that what we call matter is either an illusion, it doesn't really exist, or else it is something that emanated from pure consciousness, from pure spirit. But that's exactly the same inexplicable problem faced by materialism, except in reverse. There's no way to account, um, rationally, logically account for the fact that something purely subjective could ever produce anything objective, that pure spirit or consciousness could ever produce real matter. So materialism is problematic, idealism is problematic in terms of being able to explain the relationship between these two realities, mind and matter. Okay, and then the third view um, is dualism. It takes the, the view that both mind and matter do actually exist, but that they exist in separate domains. At least it acknowledges the reality of one and says that you can't reduce um, either matter to mind or mind to matter. Um, but that they exist in separate domains. Now, the problem with dualism is that if mind and matter, consciousness and energy, exist in different domains, then how come they could ever interact? And nobody can even begin to explain how that could happen. So we have deep problems philosophically with materialism that says that only matter is ultimately real, with idealism that says only kind, uh, mind or consciousness is ultimately real, and with dualism that says both matter and mind are real, but they exist separately in separate domains. All of those views are deeply problematic. The only view that um, seems to account for the reality and the existence and relationship between matter and mind, between consciousness and energy, is the view called panpsychism, the idea that matter energy are intrinsically sentient, that subjectivity is inherent in objectivity. There is no separation between the two. And so therefore, as life, to go back to your question, what's the relationship between the objective processes of living systems of evolution and uh, the subjective reality of consciousness, is that consciousness has always been active in evolution. It's, uh, it's uh, right from the very start, there has been awareness of possibilities and an ability to make choices among those possibilities and those have those aspects of reality have accounted for the progress of evolution being aware of alternative possibilities and then making choices that is what accounts for evolution so we can con conceive of evolution as the the grand adventure of matter energy exploring its own potentials um, consciousness is part of the process of evolution. It's not something that emerged from evolution. It's always been inherent within evolution, guiding its unfolding. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That that really makes sense. And I mean, you talk you talk about the sort of energy, and you talk about how the this subtle energy is also sentient, and that consciousness doesn't create this sort of subtle energy. Can you get into that a bit, please? Subtle energy is still a form of energy, and therefore it's something that spreads out in, in space, in subtle space. But mind or consciousness is not spatial. It doesn't have any extension. It doesn't have any volume. It doesn't exist in space at all. Non-location. It's, it's not even non-location. It's non-located. It doesn't have any existence in space whatsoever. And um, so... So subtle energy uh, is not the same as consciousness. Just as regular physical energy um, has consciousness built into it, it's intrinsically sentient, so is subtle energy intrinsically sentient as well. Is that all energy, whether it's subtle energy or gross physical energy, comes with the ability to feel, to be aware, and to make choices. And it's that ability to feel, to be aware, and to make choices. That's what consciousness is. I have a bumper sticker that sum, sums up the relationship between consciousness and, and energy, and it applies to whether it's physical energy or, or subtle energy. And the bumper sticker is simply this. Consciousness knows, energy flows. So what hmm. that means is consciousness is the ability to know, to be aware, to feel the existence of anything. Energy is what flows through existence, or what, is what flows through space. Well, consciousness is not some, one of those objects flowing through space. That's a common blind spot. 
common to both New Agers and to um, materialist philosophers is that they tend to think of consciousness as, as an object and try to apply the tools and ideas of objectivity to something that just doesn't have that kind of reality. It is subjective. When, when I'm having a deep, profound conversation with someone right. and, and I feel like I'm connecting with them and, you know, the, the phrase is usually I connected with them on, on such a high level. I mean, and I, and I feel something happening there and at maybe, I mean, you say that energy doesn't transmit. I mean, there's nothing being transmitted between me and this person as we speak. No, actually, that's not quite what I said. Um, okay. I'm saying that in in that kind of essentially telepathic connection, um, there is no energy being um, transmitted that accounts for the telepathic connection. Um, so, I mean, right now, you and I are having this conversation, and we are connecting. We are understanding each other, at least to, to some degree. But we're <laughs> right. definitely communicating. We're connecting. Um, now, in the we're speaking words and the words are traveling through cyberspace through um, through the process of electrons moving through space and and those are carrying the energy um, you know whether or not if, if we were sitting opposite each other in a room then it wouldn't be the energy wouldn't be transmitted through electrons it would be tra transmitted through vibrations in the air that's a, that's a, an exchange of energy and that certainly happens when people communicate um, there is a physical connection, an exchange of energy, but that doesn't account for the reception of meaning. So right now, to some extent, you and I are understanding each other because we're grasping the meaning that the other person is communicating. That's not contained in the air vibrations or in the electrons. Meaning is something subjective. It doesn't exist in the objective physical world. So something else is happening besides the exchange of physical energy, whether it's air vibrations or electrons, that accounts for the fact that you and I um, um, share meaning. We understand the meaning that the other is uh, communicating. That is a consciousness to consciousness, a mind to mind, a telepathic communication. And there's nothing, no energies transferred in that uh, communication. So yes, we are speaking. So for example, two lovers may be sitting together and one says to the other, I love you. Now they hear it because that's a, the, 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 the sound in the room, the, the air in the room is vibrating, that's creating the sound. And so there's a physical process taking place. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other person hears the words. But more than likely, uh, what really matters is not the fact that they hear the words, I love you. What they're really interested in is the the sincerity, the authenticity, the meaning, does that person really mean what he or she says? That is not carried in the air vibrations. There's no way to analyze or explore the, the vibrations of the air or the electrons to see if that person is really being sincere and authentic. That's something that occurs in, in, in consciousness, in the mind, and that's subjective. It's not something that occurs in space. There is no instrument that could ever detect whether or not somebody is being sincere um, um, are, are authentic. That's so. We do connect um, telepathically, but the telepathic connection is not something that uh, involves the exchange of energy through space. So we connect in two ways. We connect energetically through exchanges of energy. That happens all the time. That's a physical process of one something objective connecting with and exchanging energy with something else that's objective. But we also connect um, intersubjectively through sharing of meaning. And that's something that doesn't occur in space and doesn't require any spatial connection at all. I mean, would you say that that everything is connected? Yes, I would. Yeah. Um, in fact, I even have a chapter in, in the book Blind Spots on that. Um, you know, some years ago I had this aha moment. Um, like a lot of people, I either have these aha uh, eureka moments in the shower or while I'm driving. And this particular one happened one day while I was taking a shower, I was thinking about the, this idea that everything is connected. And it suddenly struck me, well, of course, everything is connected. It couldn't be any other way than that. Think of it this way. So 
if if you or I are not connected, or if two things are not connected, it means that there is something between them that's separating them. But if there's something between us that's separating us, then whatever is between us is also connecting us. If there is nothing between us, then there is nothing separating us. So either way, we are always connected. There is no way for any two items in reality to ever be unconnected. They are always connected in some way, because if there was anything between them, then whatever is between them connects them. And if there was nothing between them, then they would be connected anyway. So the idea that everything is connected to me is kind of ho-hum. It's like, duh, yes, of course, because there is really no other option. The really important and intriguing question to me is not whether everything is connected or not. Clearly, everything is connected to everything else. The really interesting question is, what is the nature of connection? And we connect in two ways. We connect, we connect physically through exchanges of energy, and we also connect non-physically through sharing of meaning in consciousness. Um, and the sharing of meaning in consciousness is not something that can be explained in the exchanges of energy. So, um, again, to go back to the example of two lovers communicating, they say to each other, I love you. Well, there's a connection physically through the words being spoken and the air vibrations that set up um, a chain reaction that um, ultimately um, gets processed in the brain. But none of that contains meaning. Meaning is something that occurs in consciousness. And so we connect through shared meaning, which has nothing to do with the exchanges of energy through space. Hmm. I mean, I, I found, find all of this incredibly profound, and it, it connects, it does connect with me when you put it the way you do. And I remember the chapter in your book that was kind of a softball for you. Um, I mean, you also mentioned that we, we aren't alone. We are not isolated individuals that come together to form relationships. I mean, I'd love to hear your perspective on that as well. Well, yeah, this comes back to um, a, a point that you were raising earlier about, um, you know, how do people communicate? Um, in, in one of my other books, uh, Radical Knowing, the, the theme of that book is intersubjectivity. And essentially, um, in that book, I, the subtitle is Exploring Consciousness Through Relationship. So we can explore consciousness in, in three ways, um, from what's called the, the third-person perspective, which is what neuroscience does. It explores the, the structure of the brain and the nervous system, and that gives us the objective correlates of mind and consciousness. It doesn't tell us anything about consciousness per se, but it tells us how the brain operates when when events are going on in the mind of consciousness. So that's one way, uh, neuroscience is the third person perspective. The, the other one is the first person perspective, um, which, is to, which is what people do in meditation and contemplation, where we um, take the time to go deeply into our own subjectivity and to pay attention to what's happening in that. And those are really the two standard modes that, and, that people use for exploring consciousness. And for a long time, the first-person perspective proponents would say that um, everything that the third person, the, the, the materialists are doing, um, is missing the mark. And the only true way to explore consciousness is through first-person um, contemplation, first-person investigation. In, in Radical Knowing, I point out that there is a third way, and that's um, the second-person perspective, which is through intersubjectivity. So rather than uh, just looking into our own subjective private awareness, we can pay attention to what happens when we are connecting with others in relationship. That is intersubjectivity, that my subjectivity is in a co-creative relationship with your subjectivity, that actually we are co-creating each other at every moment. That, that my, my consciousness is not only influencing your consciousness, um, but it is literally co-creating your consciousness that part of who you are is created by part of who I am and vice versa. That all sentient beings in the universe are contributing to the being, to the existence of all other sentient beings in the universe. 
um, the the Buddhist tradition um, is deeply aware of this and refers to it as codependent co-origination that everything arises um, because of its relationships with everything else. So in that sense, consciousness, the deepest nature of consciousness is not our individual subjective minds or consciousness. That that is that, that that is real. There is a reality to our individuality. But the deepest nature of who we are is not individuals. The deepest nature is um, the word I coined in that book is is individuals. Thich Nhat Hanh, the the Buddhist um, sage, refers to it as interbeing. The deepest nature of reality is relationship. And then out of this matrix, a web of relationships, you can picture it like an ocean, these waves of individuality arise out of the ocean of intersubjectivity, out of the ocean of relationship, and they exist for the length of you know, our 80, 90, 100 years, and then they dissolve, they return back into the ocean of intersubjectivity. So individuality is not the primary reality of our existence. It is real, but it is secondary. Our deepest nature, our deepest reality, is the connections, the relationships, the intersubjectivity, out of which our individuality arises, our individuality arises. Hmm. Um, wow. I mean, so would you say that this is a process of evolution, or is this intelligent design? Yes, I, I point out that in... Uh, in, in, in blind spots that the, the dilemma or the dichotomy or the confrontation between the intelligent designists, the, the creationists, and the standard view of evolution, they're not the only two options. In fact, um, both of them are in some ways accurate and, and both of them are in some ways um, wrong. Um, it's not that um, there is no intelligence in evolution, again, from the perspective of panpsychism, since all matter, all energy is intrinsically sentient, has its own subjectivity, has its own awareness, has its own ability to make choices, that right from the very start, evolution, not just here on Earth, but cosmic evolution, has involved consciousness directing the unfolding, the flowing of energy through, through the universe. Um, so there is an intelligence active within evolution. But this is not a supernatural intelligence, as the intelligent designers and the creationists assume. It's not like there's some god out there above, transcendent to reality, to the universe. No, the, the creative aspect of the universe is inherent. It's intrinsic to the universe itself. That matter energy is intrinsically creative, is intrinsically sentient, is able to make choices and that it is guiding its own unfolding, and that the process of evolution is the consciousness within matter guiding the unfolding of matter into these more and more complex forms. So from single cells to the multicellular beings that we recognize as humans and elephants and dolphins and dogs and cats and so on. So, I mean, how do we tie all this, I mean, how do we tie this together? I mean, we have sentience, consciousness, and this... This energy, I mean, how uh, there, there is this sense of, for example, when, when I start to think of a place or when I start to focus my consciousness onto a certain thing, that thing, if I think about a white Honda, I will start seeing white Hondas everywhere. Why does something like that happen? Well, it's certainly not because you're creating those white Hondas because you're thinking of them. Um, that's, that's pretty clear. You're seeing them because you've, you've now programmed your attention to be more attentive to the observation of white Hondas. I mean, that's a classical psychological phenomenon, um, but it's got nothing to do with a creation, if that's what you were thinking or implying. No, I mean, why is, why is our sentience so important? Okay, so let me just go back and make an important point, is that uh, we were asking about why, why would um, the cosmos consider human consciousness to be more significant than, say, the consciousness of some other creatures? I mentioned giraffes, but we could also talk about whales or elephants. Whales and elephants can communicate over really long distances without the benefit of developing artificial technologies that humans do. That, that, and that we require to communicate over these immense distances. 
Um, Wales can do that without um, creating technologies that in the process of creation um, negatively affect the environment and, and uh, pollute the environment and lead to the current major crisis in our world today um, of global warming and climate change. So, and of course, that's not just applied to communications technology, it's applied to all industrial types of technology in general. Whales and dolphins and elephants and, and other intelligent creatures don't need to mess up their environment in order to communicate long distances. The human species does, at least thinks it does and, and has done. Um, so it's very easy to um, imagine some cosmic greater intelligence looking at our planet and thinking um, the most intelligent species there are the ones that don't mess up their environment. And since humans um, have brought the environment to the point of near collapse, that may not only destroy ourselves, but all other um, species along with us. That doesn't strike me as the height of intelligence. And certainly from a cosmic perspective, it'd be very easy to think that, um, that the, the, the cosmic lords would decide that the whales and the dolphins and the elephants were far more intelligent than humans. Human beings aren't special. I mean, that's exactly. something that you say in your book. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, the major blind spots. In fact, I often refer to it as the, the mother of all blind spots, the idea that humans are special. It's something that you applied, implied a moment ago uh, because we have the ability to create technologies and civilizations, art and science and philosophy and religions. Yes, we have that ability. And, um, and in some ways that makes us stand out from other species. But the point to realize is that um, every species, by definition, has something special that distinguishes it from other species. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a distinct species. So yes, humans can do things that other species can't do, but they can do things that we can't do. Dolphins and bats, for example, communicate through echolocation. We can't do that without developing technologies to um, augment our natural senses. Um, so every species is different from every other species, and every species is unique. And in that sense, every species is special. And we need to give up the idea that there's something especially special about human specialness. That's the, that's the, the hubris. That's the problem that lies at the, at the foundation of the current ecological crisis we have, is that somehow or other it is assumed that because humans are special, that we have the right, not only the might, but also the right, to exploit the natural environment to suit our own desires and needs and greeds. Um, but the consequences of that view are not very pretty and are likely to um, lead to our own demise as well as the demise of many other species. So we have to give up the idea that humans are special um, or if it's important to you or anybody else to cling on to the idea that there is something special about humans, then um, you need to recognize that there's also something special about every species. That's what makes it a species. And then to follow that up with the um, acknowledgement that there is nothing especially special about human specialness. That's the point. So in that sense, humans are not special because every species is special. I and mean, one, one of the questions that I had while I was reading your book, and I think you answered it near the end, but I mean, free will, I mean, how does that work into all of this? Well, that is, um, in, in some ways, the, the $64 trillion question, does free will exist? And I think the answer to that is yes and no. Um, that to a great extent, we as organisms, as human organisms are like every other organism is, it's true that yes, we are determined to a great extent by our past. And that's what the scientific um, establishment likes to persuade us is the, is the case entirely. But it, it's while, yes, it is true that we are determined to a large extent by the laws of physics, by genetics, by biology, um, none of that accounts for the fact of consciousness. And consciousness comes with the ability to be aware of possibilities and to then make choices among those possibilities. And that's where creativity comes into being. And that's where free will comes in. So we, in addition to being determined to a great extent, 
in a sufficiently clear state of awareness, we can be aware of the possibilities present to us and then choose among those possibilities something new that didn't exist before. And so we are not fully chained to the past through determinism. Yes, to a large extent, a lot of what we do is determined, and a lot of that's very useful. We don't have to be aware of breathing and the beating of our heart, for example. All of that happens deterministically. But we do have the ability to um, interrupt the process of determinism. So, for example, right now you and I, although our breathing is happening naturally and automatically, we can choose to interrupt that process and stop breathing for a moment or two. Um, and people who um, have greater uh, psychophysical awareness can also do things like stopping their heart beating for a moment. Um, many yogis can do quite amazing things with their mind-body connection. So we can use choice and consciousness to interrupt the flow of determinism. And that's the point that gets overlooked uh, inevitably within the scientific worldview, because the scientific worldview doesn't recognize that consciousness and choice are intrinsic to reality. They see consciousness as something that emerges miraculously, of course, from the complexity of matter. Um, and that's one of the, again, one of the blind spots that I address in this book is that the idea that brains produce consciousness um, is a non-starter, that you're never going to get physical uh, you're never going to get non-physical mind or consciousness from purely physical ingredients like brain cells and nervous systems. I mean, would you say that this is sort of um, some sort of computer-simulated environment that we're in? No, I would not. Why not? Because we can um, we can have the the experience of our embodiment, and we can also have the experience of our consciousness. Um, the the embodiment is something that can move through space that uh, in, 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 again it comes back to one of the views of, um, of of idealism I said there were two versions of idealism there's the the view that says well both views say that only consciousness exists and then one view says that uh, matter energy is just an illusion and the other says no matter energy is real but is something that emanates from pure object, a pure subjective mind or, or consciousness, but you're never going to get anything truly material or truly objective from purely subjective ingredients. That's a non-starter. That's just not going to work out. Um, hmm. And then the other idea is the idea: well, that matter energy is just an illusion. But people um, who make that claim, and I've met many of them. Um, literally just don't live in the world in a way consistent with that claim. They wear clothes, they eat food, they drink liquids, they avoid cars on the freeway, and so on and so on. So everybody who claims that matter is an illusion actually lives in the world as though matter is very real. <laughs> and they've, they've got no other option. If you want to live and stay sane, you have to treat the physical world as real. Um, the physical world stubbornly insists on its own reality. If you try to live any other way, you will quickly become very bruised or worse, you will die. So people um, have to acknowledge the physical world is real. There's just no other option. It's not even something that they can choose to do. They might make the claim that, ma that matter is just an illusion, but they will always act and behave and perform in the world as though matter is real. Everybody, without exception, that I know who claims that matter is an illusion doesn't treat matter as an illusion. And I bet the same is true in your experience, that you don't know of anyone who claims that matter is an illusion who actually lives in a, in a way consistent with that claim. Now, philosophers call that a performative contradiction, that somebody makes a claim, but their action, their behavior, their performance contradicts what they claim to be the case. So when people claim that matter is just an illusion, they actually don't live in the world in a way consistent with that claim. It's a performative contradiction. Fair now, there's no, there's no way to logically refute that. That's one of the strengths of, of that form of idealism, because there's no way to step outside the mind to know anything about any extra mental reality, because everything we know about the physical world 
we know and can only know through consciousness. One of the strengths of idealism is that it is logically irrefutable because there's no way to step outside consciousness to know anything about the physical world because everything we know about the physical world, the material world, we know as something that shows up in consciousness. So all knowledge necessarily occurs in the mind, occurs in consciousness. So everything we know about the physical world, including the existence of the material physical world, is an event that occurs in consciousness. So that's a pretty strong position to take. Um, and it's logically irrefutable. But the people who claim that therefore matter is just an illusion because everything we know about the physical material world is something that occurs in consciousness, engage in a performative contradiction. While it's logically uh, irrefutable, it is pragmatically refutable. It's pragmatically problematic because people actually don't live in the world in a way consistent with the claim that matter is just an illusion. Everybody who makes that claim treats matter as though it's real because they have no other choice to, if they want to stay alive and stay sane. Yeah, fair enough. You know, Christian, I want to I want to wrap up here. I mean, we've covered a lot. I definitely recommend people check out the book for themselves, Blind Spots: 21 Good Reasons to Think Before You Talk. I mean, is there is there any one last thing that you want to get in here before we close out? Well, we talked we addressed it earlier and I think it probably is something worth emphasizing again that um, I refer to the the blind spot, the idea that humans are special as the mother of all blind spots. I think anybody with any um, sense of responsibility for the current situation in the world has to address the, the, the problem of climate change and the, and the, the, the um, influence of human actions in producing global warming and climate change. And what I do in my work is I trace that back to the, 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 the assumption the, the hubris that humans are special, and usually that is defended on two grounds. It's defended by um, religious fundamentalists by saying that we are special because God injected a soul into humans and we're the only creatures with souls, and therefore with true consciousness, with true intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, then on the scientific side, um, they say that humans are special because we have these special brains with a special neocortex that is responsible for consciousness, that if you don't have a, a neocortex, you don't have consciousness. That's the scientific view, and that's just as um, absurd as the fundamentalist view that says God injected soul or consciousness into, into humans. So both of these views, um, and by the way, of course, these are religions and sciences developed by, guess who? By humans. <laughs> and so it's, it's humans who come up with the rationale for defending the position that humans are special. I don't, I'm not aware of any um, convocation of all the species of the planet getting together and, and voting, yes, let's make the humans the dominant species in, on the planet or in the universe. That never happened, never will happen. No, the idea that humans are special is a purely human-generated idea. It's a very self-serving idea, at least on the face of it. In the end, it would probably be our self-destruction. So we need to give up the idea that humans are special and recognize that we are one species among all the other innumerable species and sentient beings and that there's nothing particularly special about human uniqueness or human specialness. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Christian, where can, um, where can people find your work? Oh, well, they can, they can go to uh, my website. Um, it's my name, christiandequincy.com. And just for those who um, have a blind spot about the letter E, De Quincy is spelled D-E-Q-U-I-N-C-E-Y. A lot of people leave out that E. And, of course, you won't get through to my website if you don't use that. And Christian is spelled the way the, 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 the religion is spelled. So it's christiandequincy.com. Um, I've got uh, links to my books and to uh, videos and articles from that website. Um, they can also connect with the Wisdom Academy there if they're interested in mentorships or courses in consciousness studies. And of course, they can get my books um, um, uh, through Amazon or in, in their local bookstore. Um, and they can see videos on YouTube, um, uh, particularly videos, a recent series of videos I did with the 
um, the host of the show Thinking Aloud, or New Thinking Aloud, Jeff, Jeffrey Mishlove. So there's a bunch of videos available on the New Thinking Aloud channel on YouTube as well. So there's a lot out there. Um, I suppose the easiest way to find out um, the, the scope of my work is to do what a lot of people do is just Google my name and that will bring up a lot of links. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your thoughts. Well, thank you, too, and I'm, and I'm sorry we had such an interrupted uh, communication. This is The Human Experience, and we are going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for listening.